This is the Road to Life Plan, Video 2. Part 2, Problems and Perspectives. The bad news. The most immediate problem is the imminent, complete loss of the Arctic ice cap. When the Arctic ice is gone, warmer waters from the North Atlantic and the North Pacific will mix into the once ice-covered Arctic Ocean, and within a matter of days, equilibrium temperature will be reached. Then the Arctic will be an ocean of warm water instead of cold ice. The ice will no longer reflect sunlight back into space. Instead, the open seawater will absorb the solar radiation. This will have enormous effect on the jet stream, which will in turn severely affect the entire planet. The air conditioning effect of the once frozen Arctic will then be shut down. This will cause the inlands of the continents to bake. The bread baskets will bake. Mankind's main food supplies will be devastated. Winds will blow across the open Arctic waters and send waves crashing into shorelines that because of the ice have seen no waves for 2.6 million years. Then the warmer climate will melt the permafrost even faster than it already is. Methane from the resulting unfrozen organics that the permafrost is made of will be released in ever-increasing amounts. In addition, there is a shallow shelf off the coast of Siberia called the East Siberian Arctic Shelf that is larger than the states of Texas and Oklahoma combined, with a mean depth of 50 meters, whose subsea permafrost covers the largest methane reservoir on Earth and is now boiling with thousands of methane plumes rising from the sea floor. And the amount of them is increasing at an alarming rate. Arctic research scientists say this methane is under pressure and that there is a high potential for a giant methane carbon bubble to be released at any time. They say that there is currently about 5 gigatons of carbon in the global atmosphere and that this amount is about 1% of the amount of carbon under the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. The Arctic sea ice may be completely gone as early as September of 2018. The President of Finland, Mr. Sali Nanisto, in a press conference with the U.S. President Donald Trump on August 28, 2017, said, quote, If we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe. That is reality. End quote. The melting Arctic is a global emergency, but so far basically nothing has been done about it except talk. Beyond the immediate problem of the melting Arctic ice cap, there are many other complicated and deadly problems that mankind must address in order to survive. There is nothing that can help, so far. So far we have no plan. This plan for the road to life will show the general path we must go on. It is a plan that can work. The good news. Science tells us that it is physically possible for mankind to refreeze the Arctic. The ice that covers the Arctic Ocean is basically a bank of ice instead of a bank of money. Essentially, all man has to do is add to the ice to bring the bank up to proportions that are once again sustainable and safe. A team of researchers from the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University in their report published on 19 December 2016 in the Earth's Future, an open access AGU journal, entitled Arctic Ice Management, says that the Arctic can be covered with 100 million wind-operated pumps that will suck up and spray out seawater that will freeze and build up the ice. The report says that the cost to cover the Arctic with pumps over a 10-year period is 0.64% of the world's GDP, or 3.8 trillion U.S. dollars, which is 13% of the USA's yearly federal budget. The report goes on to say that the production of ice by these wind pumps is so efficient that 10%, or 10 million of the wind pumps, might be enough. Which is, of course, good news. The report adds that covering the entire Arctic with 100 million wind pumps 
is comparable to the entire U.S. automobile industry every year for 10 years, or the cost of the Iraqi war. Therefore, refreezing the Arctic is doable, if we can come up with the money. The question. When the war on Iraq began, the U.S. hired a giant contractor to go into Iraq and build military air bases and facilities. If we did this to fight terrorism, why don't we hire a giant contractor now to go into the Arctic and get the project of refreezing the Arctic done? A giant contractor could make a lot of money. Even though refreezing the Arctic is more important to the survival of the human race than any war has ever been, nothing is being done. Why? Speculation. If I were one of the powers that be, let's call them the elite for simplicity, whomever they are, I think I would have access to advanced technologies that are hidden from the public. I would have a plan that would include provisions for shutting down nuclear power plants, refreezing the Arctic, and reducing the human population. I might consider using the melting of the Arctic as part of the population reduction plan. I might plan to hide away a few months and then come out and refreeze the Arctic using the hidden technology and bring the climate back to a temperature where man can live again. I would have a science-based, engineered, and modeled plan. It would be think-tanked. The objective would be to reduce the population down to a manageable level that the Earth could sustain and life can begin again. I would set up a new world order. But I would not be happy about it. The chances of it not working would be great. If I were an elite, I would only risk it if I felt I had to. If I were implementing this secret plan, however, I would keep it secret. The public would not know, but there would be clues that a secret plan was in place. One clue might be that nothing is being done about the melting Arctic. Another clue might be that Greenland and the Arctic are melting because the ice is being darkened by what researchers are calling black carbon. Black carbon in the Arctic and Greenland, according to the president of Finland, comes from old technology coal-fired power plants in Russia and burning oil fields. I have seen pictures of burning oil fields in the Middle East and wondered why they were being allowed to continue burning. But if I wanted to hasten the Arctic melt, I would allow the oil fields to continue burning. Could this be a clue? Suddenly they're letting us smoke pot in most of the United States. Could this be a clue? They install a distraction-making type of president, Donald Trump. Could this be a clue? Could 9-11 have been a trial run for this ultimate deception? These apparent clues, and my own gut instincts, lead me to speculate that another action plan is probably already in place, and that it may very well be moving into position right now. If there was a plan for the elite to come out of their underground bunkers and refreeze the Arctic, what technology might they use? HARP, H-A-A-R-P, stands for High Frequency Active Aurora Research Project. It was initiated to the public by President Ronald Reagan as his Star Wars program, where he told us we would have a system that would create a shield over the USA that would protect us from enemy missiles. But HARP is defined as a weather modification weapon that has been cloaked in secrecy and is heavily labeled as a conspiracy magnet. HARP is technology originally developed by Nikola Tesla, who is the genius that brought mankind alternating current electrical power and many other technologies. In the 1990s, the U.S. built HARP in Alaska. It was an array of 180 antennas that were each about 72 feet tall. It was a 5 gigawatt facility designed to shoot several million watt microwave beam into concentrated areas of the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere, causing the ionosphere to heat up and lift. This lifting of the ionosphere causes a rush of air to fill the vacuum created below, causing a local weather disturbance. This is the most basic concept of the design, but it has many other capabilities as well 
including shooting ELF signals through the Earth to communicate with submarines, find underground facilities, and even oil and gas deposits. The original HARP was sold to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks in 2015, but the technology has advanced, and many more HARP type of antenna arrays have been built in various places in the world, and some similar technologies are even mobile. A new HARP type of facility has been built in Tormso, Norway, that is 100 gigawatts, and it turns out that most of these ionospheric heaters are located around the Arctic. I am not an expert in HARP technology, but I do know that the Earth has an ionosphere and a magnetic field, and I can see that there are many of these HARP types of facilities and also related instruments such as digisons, which measure the ionosphere all over the world. If these facilities are connected to a master computer that can control all of them, it can cause them to focus and fire multiple beams of energy into the ionosphere within the context of a computer program, then it is conceivable that the ionosphere could be manipulated like Mozart playing the keys on a piano. In this way, I speculate that the Arctic could be refrozen by simply pushing buttons. Part 3. The Solution the Road to Life Plan. Step 1. Realize we are poisoned by money. We realize that money is a poison to us, that this poison possesses us, and that we have lost control of our lives and of our environment and our responsibility to watch over all life on earth because of the deceptive poison of money. Why should we consider money a poison? The road to life is set up in 12 steps because the poison of money is similar to the poison of alcohol. One of the principles taught in Alcoholics Anonymous is that alcoholism is a disease. An alcoholic reaches the end of his run and faces either death or sobriety and is forced to finally get sober. When he sobers, his eyes are opened and he looks back at the shambles he has made of his life and goes into depression and possibly contemplates suicide. Then Alcoholics Anonymous tells him that alcoholism is a disease, a poison, that the reason he has done all these terrible things is because the disease, poison, caused him to behave insanely. When the man realizes his actions were the result of a poison, and that he would not have done them if he had not been under the influence of the poison, then he is able to stop blaming himself and others, and he steps onto the road of recovery. Today, mankind is running around in different directions. We blame everyone else for everything. It's important that we realize that money is a poison, because that realization takes the blame away from all of us. The blame is one of the main things that is keeping us apart. It is like the analogy of the man with rabies. The man goes insane because of the poison that is in him. He is not responsible for the damage he does while the poison is infecting him because he is out of his mind. When the man receives the antidote and comes out of his poison-induced stupor, he returns to the same person he was before and sees the damage he's done. Then he takes responsibility for it and repairs it the best he can. He does not go to jail. There is no blame. Seeing money as a poison also allows mankind to get our collective arms around the problems we have created. When we realize that basically all of them are based on the underlying cause of a poison and that we have created them under the influence of this poison, then we can easily see what the solution is to get rid of the poison. Once we end our use of money, then our minds will clear and we will begin our recovery onto the road to life. Is money a poison? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines poison as a substance that through its chemical action usually kills, injures, or impairs an organism, something destructive or harmful, 
an object of aversion or abhorrence, a substance that inhibits the activity of another substance or the course of reaction or process, a catalyst poison. The rabies virus is a poison that affects the brain and causes insanity. The drug heroin is a poison. Alcohol is a poison. These poisons do things to the human brain that cause people to behave insanely. Conducting a study to determine how money affects the human neurochemical system seems like something the government would want to do as one of their many studies. I always assume that studies on how money affects mankind have already been done. But what if they haven't? Because the fact is, I'm not finding much research in this area. Or maybe it's classified research, I don't know. But what if we really don't know much about money being a poison? If money is a poison and we don't know much about it, then that makes us rather vulnerable, doesn't it? It is like the analogy of the Starship Enterprise. We are caught up in the effects of a poison without realizing we are poisoned, even the crew and the captain. There are, however, a few studies that have been done. Direct correlations have been found between the brain pathologies of the cocaine addict and the brain pathologies of the use of money. Pain, fear, and pleasure share the same brain pathologies and are also powerfully influenced by money today. Fear of money runs the gambit between a slow anxiety-induced type of fear to the adrenaline-rushed fear into fight or flight. Television commercials home in on our pleasure instincts as well as other instincts. Science and psychology are both used in designing advertisement campaigns. Money affects people differently, depending upon how much you have of it. According to research conducted by Paul Piff, Associate Professor of Psychology and Social Behavior, Ph.D., UC Berkeley, money affects people as follows. Wealthier people are more likely to excuse greed and selfishness. Wealthier people are less likely to be pro-social and more likely to cheat and break laws. People who make less money are more likely to be more generous and share. Rich people are more likely to ignore pedestrians. Poverty impedes cognitive function, thinking ability. Those with less money are better at reading facial expressions, can read emotions better. Here is a list of some of the main mental disorders in America today. Depression disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Imagine how much money has to do with each of these disorders. Depression can obviously be strongly influenced by money. Anxiety and stress are closely related and the American Psychological Association has placed money as the number one cause of stress in America since 2007. Panic disorder can certainly be influenced by lack of money, as well as depression, anxiety, and stress. Obsessive compulsive disorder could be considered a symptom of the stress caused from dealing with money. Post-traumatic stress disorder often comes from war, which is caused by money, in my opinion. At any rate, one can see that money has a strong influence on mental disorders. It's amazing how much money affects all of us. It identifies us, and we take on the identity that it gives us. The poor man is humble, while the rich man is proud. Yet all of us walk around like zombies, oblivious to the unnatural, devastated reality of the real world. We have become money zombies. Is money an addictive poison? A review paper titled The Neuroscience of Addiction describes addiction as addiction, also known as a substance dependence, American Psychiatric Association, 1994, is a chronically relapsing disorder that is characterized by three major elements. One, 
compulsion to seek and take the drug. 2. Loss of control in limiting intake. And 3. Emergence of a negative emotional state, for example, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, when access to the drug is prevented, defined here as a dependence. Kube and Lamol, 1997. Does this description of addiction not describe the relationship between mankind and money? Do people not use money compulsively? Do they not seek it out? And when we find it, how much more of it do we want? Do we ever really have enough? And when our money is taken away from us, do we not go through withdrawals? Is this not why we have insurance and attorneys to protect us? Money creates an environment for conflict and consumption. Money, in its most basic form, is a mentally binding agreement between two people that leaves one person obligated to the other. But this mentally binding agreement is more complicated than it looks. It creates an environment not only for human conflict, but also for the reckless consumption of the earth. First of all, the value of money is arbitrary. The man who gives it may have earned it at the rate of $100 per hour, while he may be paying the man receiving it at the rate of $5 per hour. When the two men make the agreement, shake hands and walk away, the one who is paying the money will begin to wonder if the other will live up to the agreement. The receiver may realize he just made a deal for far less than he should have. He might spend the money and then feel apathetic about the deal and not want to fulfill his end of the agreement. The lender might become angry. The situation can become heated fast. Any number of things can happen. If you get a notice that your house payment is going up for the second time in two years because of rising property taxes and insurance rates, you might be rather perturbed over it. Then again, if you complete a successful monetary agreement and you feel you have gotten the better part of the deal, you may feel pride. And if you complete a number of agreements successfully with gain, then you may want to complete more, and you might one day perceive yourself as better than other people, while other people might perceive you as greedy. The point is that the monetary agreement sets the stage for human conflict. Money also causes mankind to consume the earth for money. In the Clint Eastwood movie, Pale Rider, which takes place, I would guess, around 1880 or so, a rich gold mine runs water down a hill through increasingly narrow pipes until it develops high-pressure jet sprays that he uses to blast the hillside to sluice out the gold. The Exxon Valdez was a single-hull oil tanker. Exxon knew that double hulls were safer, but obviously more expensive. The great Amazonian rainforests are called the lungs of the earth, but they have been cut down for exotic woods and burned down to make plantations. Nuclear power plants are supposed to be efficient and keep energy's costs down. But how much have Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima nuclear power plants cost mankind and the earth. How many people, animals, and sea creatures have these disasters killed? The root of all these abominations to the earth is money. We have consumed the earth and sold the earth insanely for money. Need I go on? In one way or another, the poison of money enters the human brain and changes the way we think. Instead of the human being rising in the morning, especially in the first world countries like America, and thinking of the reality of life like our ancestors did, thinking of the hunt, the phase of the moon, the direction the wind is blowing, and how part of the group of edible plants in the valley must be left for regeneration. The human under the influence of the poison of money rises in the morning and thinks about how to feed the poison. In other words, how to make money. A man gets up in the morning, turns on the light and the television, and gets dressed and eats toast with a slice of ham while he checks his stocks on the internet and listens to propaganda-laden trivial politics on the news.
Then he gets into his car and drives to work, worrying that he could be late if there's a traffic accident. He thinks about the conflict he has to resolve at the office. He thinks about all these kinds of things that seem natural to him, but are in reality an artificial reality built upon energy and an infrastructure system that is controlled by money. The typical American doesn't know what phase the moon is in or what direction the wind is blowing. He cares that his car runs so that he can get to work, but he doesn't care that the seals in the harbor are swimming through kaleidoscopic sheens of oil with their nostrils flaring from the oil that his car is dripping. Money blinds us to reality and makes us think the artificial reality we live in is real and more important than the reality of the natural environment that we actually do live in. If gaining more money involves the plundering and sale of the earth, then that is what will be done, because our hearts have been blinded. If making money involves the internal combustion engine to create trillions of tiny fires all over the world and sacrifice the oceans in the process, then that is what will be done. The poison of money changes the way a man thinks. Somehow it messes with our brains and makes us forget about respecting our planet. How do we compare to our hunter and gatherer ancestors? When we compare our ways of life to history, it seems we always go back to earlier examples of civilized man. But seldom do we compare our lives to ancient man. We compare, for example, capitalism to socialism and communism and totalitarianism and such, but we rarely, if ever, compare our civilized ways of life to our hunter and gatherer ancestors' ways of life. By not comparing ourselves to our ancestors, we miss understanding the basics that our lives are truly founded upon. Let's do a simple comparison then. Let's compare several characteristics of the ancient hunter and gatherer life to the same characteristics of civilized life, where mankind is poisoned by money. Hunter and gatherer life. No change. From generation to generation, technology stayed fairly constant. Weapons, tools, clothing, and shelters remained basically the same. Civilized life. The money effect. Change. From generation to generation, technology continuously improves. Each generation experiences new technology, new technologies becoming more extreme after the Industrial Revolution. Hunter and gatherer life. No change. Population remained fairly constant. Civilized life. Change. Population generally steadily grew until mankind harnessed the power of fossil fuels. Then our population spread all over the world. Hunter and gather. No change. Ecosystems thrive. Civilized life. Change. Ecosystems are relentlessly consumed, suffer, and die. Hunter and gatherer life. No change. In general, each new generation was similar to the generations before. Civilized life. Change. In general, each new generation is different than the one before. The point of this comparison is to show that our ancient hunter and gatherer ancestors lived the same basic lives for many generations without much change. But change is the hallmark of the civilized man's life. For example, the first human-carrying airplane flight happened in 1903 by the Wright brothers. The automobile didn't start getting mass-produced until about 1910. World War I began in 1914 and ended in 1918. By the time it ended, we had biplanes, blimps, battleships, submarines and aircraft carriers, as well as tanks and trucks and jeeps and motorcycles. This enormous change happened in one generation. The World War I generation led into the generation of the Great American Depression. Then came the Second World War and the introduction of nuclear bombs. Then the Korean War, 
Vietnam and the Middle East wars, along with highways and skyscrapers and smartphones and asymptotic population growth. Each new generation faces a new horizon. Today's generation faces the horizon of the end of man. No generation of mankind has ever faced this horizon before. What is the true leader of a corporation? Probably the most significant way today that money rules the world is through corporations. It is now said that corporations rule the world. Here in the USA, corporations have apparently been given the same rights as individual human beings. What have we given these rights to? Who or what is the true leader of a corporation? A corporation is made up of workers, a CEO, a board of directors, and stockholders. The CEO is hired to run the corporation so that it makes money. If the CEO does not make money, the board of directors fires the CEO and hires a new CEO who will do whatever it takes for the corporation to make money. The board that hires the new CEO, however, is driven by the stockholders, but the stockholders are invested through mutual funds and don't know much about the corporations their money is supporting. All the stockholders care about is whether their funds go up or down. If the stocks are not making enough money, which can be hard to do in this competitive world of dwindling resources, the CEO is then forced to make decisions based on money instead of common sense. So the CEO tightens the budget and passes that constraint down to his managers below. Then a manager under the pressure of the CEO makes a decision based on money instead of common sense. The expensive valve is not purchased, and suddenly the Gulf of Mexico is loaded with over 200 million gallons of oil. Who or what caused this to happen? Some would say the manager is at fault because he did not purchase the necessary valve, but he was pressured by the CEO, who was in turn pressured by the board of directors, who were pressured by the stockholders whose only care was to increase their stocks. Money is the common denominator for all the pressure and all the decisions. The bottom line is the stockholders, but all they care about is if the stock goes up or down. All decisions, therefore, are made based on money with the ultimate intent of increasing money. Money is, therefore, the true leader of a corporation. Is it money or the love of money? Money is said to be the root of all evil. Some people say that it is not money, but the love of money that is the root of all evil. But that is like saying that it is not the heroine that destroys the addict, it is the addict's love of the heroine. Can the heroine addict continue to use the heroine if he does not love it? The implication is that mankind can continue to use money as long as we don't love it. But the truth is that money is an addictive poison like heroin. And just like the heroin addict cannot help but to love the heroin, human beings cannot help but to love the money. Money produces euphoria, and that high is what we want. Have you ever experienced the euphoria of coming into a lot of money? Have you ever won a jackpot on a slot machine, or unknowingly inherited a fortune, or been given money at a critical time of need? or even the mild euphoria of confidence in having a decent wad of cash in your pocket. Do you recall what that feels like? It is this feeling of pleasure that is the prize we strive for, that we call the love of money. It makes us feel secure, but it also has its downside. Can you recall the fear you felt when you lost your job, or faced bankruptcy, or couldn't pay the power bill? There are two sides to the money coin, the side of pleasure and the side of fear. But the two sides do not seem to be equal because it seems that there is more fear than euphoria. There are more poor people than there are rich. And the poor will work three jobs if they have to, and they will rob and go to prison more than the rich. They don't do these things for the love of money. They do them for survival. No one can realistically live off the land anymore. Should we call money a spirit or a poison? Imagine if a person got rabies and went to a doctor, and the doctor also had to take into account that the disease was caused from a spirit. How would the doctor deal with it? The rabies virus, poison, is relatively easy to treat. 
But a spirit is much more involved and can be interpreted many different ways. The treatment for a spirit might run the gambit between shaking a doll over the sick person to having an exorcism performed. Treatment for a spirit would end up with a victim still going insane and dying from the poison, but treatment of the rabies poison would actually cure the victim. Many things can attack mankind. Diseases, pestilences, meteors from the sky, and also spirits and poisons. A spirit, however, conjures up images of things we see in our nightmares, but are not there in reality. Children, and even adults, especially after watching a horror movie, think they see things in the shadows of the dark. When the lights are turned on, they realize that nothing is there. The word spirit gives a name to those imagined shadow images and inflates the imagined possibility that something might actually be there. The word spirit conjures up images of swirling clouds and godlike powers in our minds. Humanity has been describing the unknown as spirits for a long time, especially in religions. We even talk of good and bad spirits. A poison, however, acts in the same manner as an evil spirit and produces the same symptoms. But a poison is real, and the word poison doesn't conjure up superstitious images or behaviors. If a person gets rabies, for example, and goes insane, we know it is because the poison that infected him. But if a person just goes insane without an apparent poison, then we don't know what caused his insanity, and we might say it was a spirit when in reality it's most likely from a spider bite or some kind of metabolic disease or tumor on the brain. The power of the poison of money is strong enough without adding emotionally charged spiritual type description. For this reason, I prefer to refer to money as a poison that has infected mankind, not a spirit. What is a spirit? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines spirit as a capitalized Holy Spirit, soul, an often malevolent being that is bodiless but can become visible, specifically ghost, a malevolent being that enters and possesses a human being. Dictionary.com defines spirit as the meaning carry off or away secretly, as though by supernatural agency is first recorded in the 1660s. Spirit of medicine, spirit. Spirits, an alcohol solution of an essential or volatile substance. Can you see how the word spirit involves the emotional parts of the mind? Do you see how these emotions cloud the logical processes of thinking that people normally use to not be afraid of the dark? Money is not a living thing, and yet it is. It makes decisions and rules the world, though it has no body and no mind. And money infects only Homo sapiens. No other species on our planet can be infected by this poison. Only the human mind, with its powerful ability to think, is vulnerable to this particular poison. This poison makes us live in artificial reality that appears to make us dependent upon the use of money and living in an artificial world that is separate from nature. The great wall that blocks mankind's passage to life is an artificial wall. It is a figment of our imaginations. It makes us think that we must live under the system in which it rules, and that there is no other choice. Meanwhile, it does not compare mankind's civilized life with money to the life of our ancestors who did not use money. When the poison is removed, our eyes will open and we will begin our journey on the road to life.